Hi everyone and good evening. A warm welcome to all our speakers here with us today and to anyone joining in through YouTube. Uh, today we're kicking off with, with the first panel of one of many in a series, um, which is going to look into the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on several different areas in our society throughout the UK. Of course, today we're here to discuss specifically the economic and financial impact of COVID-19 on both businesses and communities in South London. And we're fortunate to be joined with an expert panel who will be talk talking about how we're perhaps tackling inequalities on a local level and, and the opportunities and difficulties that the COVID-19 pandemic has raised in, in society. We have with us today Hannah Chapman, an experienced programme manager and workshop facilitator for two to three degrees. Councillor Manji Sahul Hamid, a member of the Labour Party who represents Broad Green Ward within the borough of Croydon. And last but not least, Solomon Smith, co-founder and CEO of Brixton Soup Kitchen. Uh, so once again, welcome to everyone and thank you for accepting our invitation to be here with us today. Uh, I just want to share a few facts about how the pandemic has impacted South, Inc., South of London specifically uh, before I pass on to a first speaker today. Uh, so despite some measures being put in place by government to kind of mediate the impact of the pandemic uh, on people's livelihoods, such as, you know, wage subsidies and, and cheap business loans, several people have unfortunately faced financial difficulties during the pandemic. And perhaps this is something we're going to see uh, play out larger as, as time passes. Uh, but from what we know so far, South London saw its unemployment level raised by 129%. Um, although the lowest figure in London, this is, is still quite worrying. People using food banks have increased by 128% in London uh, since September 2019 to 2020. Uh, and unfortunately, we know that those Londoners who are li living in deprived areas were more likely to have the negative health impacts of the pandemic as well. So it's not something that, that perhaps is just including finance or perhaps finance isn't something that that's a single uh, factor that we can look at and perhaps it does impact or, or certainly research shows that it impacts other areas of our society and well-being as, as individuals as well. Uh, so today we're excited to be discussing you know forward-thinking initiatives, community-oriented initiatives and, and solutions for the in, um, economic impact of, of COVID-19 in South London. And we'll be hearing how our local communities have responded to the short-term shocks uh, in search of long-term solutions. Uh, and you know, the aim of today really is to engage in a dialogue to bring depth and nuanced understanding uh, of those heavily involved with local communities and, and seeing what, what's being done on a local level and, and what we can perhaps see uh, happening on on a local level as well. Uh, so without dragging out any further, I'd like to pass the phone to our first phone, sorry, <laughs> my virtual mic, with everything being so virtual at the moment, uh, to the first speaker today, which is Hannah Chapman. Uh, Hannah, thank you for being here with us and, and we're looking forward to listening to the initiatives that, that you've been involved with uh, regarding the topic of the panel. Thank you so much, Aisha. And yeah, uh, thanks to everyone at the Dialogue Society for um, inviting me to be on this panel. Um, it's a topic that I'm really passionate about. And um, yeah, from being, as Aisha quite rightly said, when she introduced kind of us as panellists, um, I'm a programme manager and facilitator at Two Three Degrees. Um, and throughout the time that I've been at Two Three Degrees the past few years, um, the pandemic has definitely hit the youth sector um, incredibly hard. And yeah, it's just great to be here to talk about uh, these such important topics and shine a light on the spotlight of um, the young people, um, people who've been affected uh, really kind of adversely, in my opinion, uh, through the pandemic. And um, yeah, just kind of some work that we've been doing behind the scenes to really alleviate these problems. So before I go into a bit more detail about that, I wanted to um, give a bit of background on who we are at Two to Three Degrees and why we exist. So Two to Three Degrees is a social enterprise uh, which effectively exists to help young people be the best versions of themselves. Um, and we do that by running employability and personal development programmes, um, different events and different kind of topics that we discuss um, 
to ensure that young people are effectively being taught not only kind of employability skills, so you know your CV, cover letter, how to get into work, um, all these really important topics, but also in terms of personal development, uh, which is we're really passionate about because you can leave university or school um, and not be taught about you know how to increase your resilience, your confidence, um, how to pitch, how to public speak. Um, these are things that I certainly wasn't taught about, and I think throughout the pandemic, I think such as resilience and confidence and well-being um, have been really topical issues. And um, yeah, through our kind of programs that we've run, we've basically existed to support these young people, especially through these really tough times. So some of the programs that um, I've managed and run uh, in South London, um, kind of starting off in 2020, we ran a program um, online due to kind of the pandemic and things like that, um, which was I would say a new kind of turning point for the youth sector. A lot of youth work is generally done face to face. So having kind of to navigate these uncertain times, uh, we decided to run a programme online called Summer's Not Cancelled. Um, and this was supported by Southwark Council um, and basically the priorities of this programme to ensure that young people had an offer to structure their lives in these really difficult times, being locked down, not being able to go to school, see friends, family. Um, and yeah, we wanted to really increase their personal skills and to navigate um, through un these uncertain times, but to predominantly increase their confidence, resilience, business skills, uh, well-being social action um, through kind of the community and awareness um, kind of of employment opportunities despite these tough times you know we can still kind of work together and think about what your next steps are the pandemic doesn't mean that your life comes to a halt um, life will continue to go on just in a new normal um, as we were kind of saying lately is a kind of new <laughs> the new direction for us all um, so other programs we've kind of ran uh, that I managed as well was the Head Start Action program, uh, which we did in partnership with London Youth and the Mayor's Violence Reduction Unit. Um, and a lot of these programs are kind of focused on, again, personal development and employability. But what made Head Start Action um, a, a highlight for me was that um, it really focused on social action and what you can do in the local community. So despite running the program online, we really wanted to ensure that communities, uh, businesses, and young people are connected um, through the power of technology. So we use platforms such as Zoom to um, you know, link young people up with local employers and to link up with local councils, um, with local young people who may be not on the programme, but are interested kind of in doing something in their local area. Um, so young people ran initiatives around social action about homelessness, littering, um, well-being and mental health, again, very topical in these times. Um, and yeah, it was, I think, what one of the really positive things, I've said a lot about neg the negatives of the pandemic, but I guess one of the really positive things that we saw from this programme is young people's resilience to be like, actually, yeah, we are in a really tough time right now, but what can we do to shape the future? Um, and quite rightly so, young people are our future and will be our next kind of labour force coming into the market, new, our next entrepreneurs. Um, you know, it's all coming about and we really want these young people to take action and um, yeah, to put their best foot forward to be their best selves. So it was really great to see young people be so socially active and aware of such issues going on. Um, and to share this, um, we had a panel, like a kind of celebration event at the end where the young people showcased the work that they've been doing in the local communities through their online social action um, by taking the storm on internet and creating videos and um, Instagram accounts, Twitter to raise awareness on their causes and to raise money um, also as well. So again, I, it's not all doom and gloom from the pandemic, but I guess there's some kind of key highlights that have come about. And uh, to give it a bit more of structure to what I'm saying from on the ground experiences, I really wanted to talk about um, Youth Employment UK's 2021 census, um, which I think really underpins uh, the, the data kind of side of our on the ground experiences. And um, I think one of the key, I think one of the key kind of percentages that really sticks with me I would say is that 49% of young people aged 16 to 25 felt less positive about their futures um, as a result of the pandemic um, throughout 2020 and, and 2021 and even quite rightly still now so this uh, percentage is incredibly accurate but 49% of young people that's nearly the overwhelming majority of the young people who kind of 
filled out um, surveys and you know fed their responses back. Um, I think that's an over that, you know an overwhelming statistic to show that these young people feel like they don't they don't feel as positive about their future. Um, so I think we've got a lot to do in the youth sector to ensure that we're supporting young people. But it doesn't just stick with uh, youth the kind of youth and sector it goes beyond that so it means that um, communities um, councils businesses um, and wider policy makers and the movers and shakers in government need to kind of open their eyes to realize that these young people need some support they need to be able to feel like they're heard um, and on the kind of topic of being heard um, I think that a lot of young people are feeling that there's not a space for them so and this is really highlighted when uh, I think another statistic from this report is that it says 81.9% of young people don't think that there are enough opportunities to share their views on important issues in their area. So uh, I'll just repeat that again, 81.9% of young people don't think that there are enough opportunities to share their views on important issues in their area. So I think that really does hit home about young people being at the table at the for the COVID-19 recovery plan um, and ensuring that they are being heard um, and that they do have kind of a say in what happens next. Um, so I think having panel discussions such as these are so important um, so that we can really shine a light on, um, you know, the feelings of young people currently. And I think uh, data such as the kind of um, Youth Employment UK census in 2021 really does kind of hit home on that one. Um, I guess we can also kind of discuss um, some areas in terms of school and universities of young people. Um, and again, education was majorly hit because young people, it was so disruptive for young people that they weren't going into school, they weren't, you know, going to university, having their normal lectures or lessons in person. Um, and that has a, a knock on effect, not only for just well being, but their, their studies and how they're going to progress um, for the future. So, for example, some, tw I think it's 28 point, yeah, 28.5% of young people rated their careers advice, um, like kind of in their secondary school or university, as good or excellent that's only 28%. Again, it's not, it's not very high. Like it's great to see that some people were really receiving that good support. And again, we can highlight this as, as a kind of a milestone that we can think, okay, some people really did feel like they were supported, but it's not the overwhelming majority. So um, yeah, I think there's a lot that we can do to support young people in these really tough times. Um, and that's why Two Three Degrees exists as an organization, um, because it's really important that we run such programs um, such as Head Start Action, such as Summer's Not Cancelled. And another program that we ran in the pandemic is called Reach Up. And we ran it in partnership with UK Youth and Coca-Cola European Partners. Um, and we basically wanted to give young people access to um, employers and see what the new normal is kind of like, how, what are Zoom calls like, how, how do we send an email, um, you know, all these kind of things that we might as business professionals see as very normal and adjust to in the pandemic. For a young person entering kind of the workforce in these really difficult times, um, it's, <laughs> it's definitely going to be a learning curve for them. So it was really great through this programme that we had um, Euro uh, the Coca-Cola European Partners staff volunteering to talk about what work is like, to talk about how the new normal and how, you know, majority of them wo are working from home and um, what that looks like. So it was great to kind of see businesses really working together, to support local young people um, at a, and a worldwide kind of company such as Coca-Cola European Partners. So um, again, a, a nice kind of good highlight that we had from that. Um, but yeah, I guess I can kind of uh, wrap up a bit more unless there's any specific questions that Aisha wants me to, to address. But um, in, a, in a nutshell, I think that in terms of the impact that COVID-19 has had on employability um, and kind of the economic sphere that young people are facing in South London um, and more, bro more broadly in London, I think there's a lot that we need to do to uh, think about the repercussions of COVID-19 and uh, the young people who are gonna be growing up and thinking, oh yeah, like that's kind of normal now. Like we can't even imagine what the future is gonna look like. And I think that is, um, a wonderful opportunity, yet also um, a slight daunting prospect. Um, hopefully we don't have anything that kind of lockdowns and things like that become a thing of the past and we can look back and say actually well-being and things like that wise we have come together as a community to you know really support each other and realize that it's okay to not be okay. 
but hopefully um, I like to be optimistic and think that um, kind of local communities, young people, um, the policy makers, and also businesses will kind of realize, think actually, there's a lot that we can do to support these young people in these difficult times. Let's try and give them online work experience. We'd love to see more of that. Um, more kind of support, support for young people, places where they can voice their opinions. And finally, giving them um, opportunities to grow and thinking this young person has been through a lot. Uh, let's really just think about what we can provide for them um, to make this transition into kind of the new normal, um, as normal as it can, and kind of smooth as it can be um so yeah that's that's kind of it for me on the the key topics uh that we've just going to be discussing tonight thank you so much hannah uh it's really clear and it was nice to see you know the passion in yourself for the work that you're doing uh especially in the youth sector and i think the youth sector is perhaps one that we can kind of forget about when we're talking about you know the economy or finance and we forget that you know the youth are our future and, and the role that they have in our society is, is kind of priceless because it is the continuation of of what we do uh and i love that you know the work you do is is to help them become the best that that they can be uh and and you know you mentioned resilience and confidence but i think the most important thing perhaps is the leadership skills that that you're allowing them to experience in, in all the projects that you're doing uh and you know you mentioned that you know it's great that we're coming here together to talk about these things um hopefully you know this panel series as, as a whole will be later be kind of translated into a policy paper um, and we can take the messages and things that we're discussing here a step further uh, so thank you very much for kind of all the work that you do in, in society on a local level uh, and for also being here and, and sharing it with us today um, if I am going to check uh, at the end of the panel and, and hopefully I can feed the questions that, that come in uh, at the end um, but just to kind of go into our, our next speaker, uh, Councillor Manju Sahul Hamid, uh, thank you for being here with us today. Um, and we look forward to, to hearing what, what you have to bring to the discussion. Thanks, Aisha, for the introduction. Um, thanks to Dialogue Society for providing this opportunity to share the economic and uh, financial impact of COVID-19 to communities. Um, so I just wanted to share my responsibilities before going to um, talk about the impact. So um, in addition to being a councillor in Brooklyn Ward, um, as you introduced me, um, I'm also a cabinet member for community safety and business recovery. So that what that means is um, supporting the business community in Croydon, especially during COVID. Uh, businesses had a huge impact um, of um, COVID and um, you know some of them had they had to close their venues but the government has introduced the business grant, especially the evening and nighttime economy grant, the retail and the hospitality grant, and the council were um, um, in the forefront, making sure that we distribute that grant to the business community quite e um, efficiently and effectively. And so far in Croydon, we have distributed over 93 million pounds of business grant to our business communities in the borough. And uh, we have, there are um, over 15,000 businesses in Croydon and 98% um, of them are small and uh, medium sized businesses. So you can see uh, the impact COVID had on those business communities. So the pandemic obviously had interrupted many of the regular and valuable interactions between London and the wider Southeast. Commuting slowed um, to a trickle and international visitors stopped arriving at airports. And obviously, us in Croydon, we are very close to Gatwick, and that had a huge impact on our population, especially we had a quite a number of people from Croydon working in Gatwick, and um, so they you know, couldn't work, and also uh, that had a huge impact. So this led to serious economic disruption, especially in areas reliant on these kind of activities, in, including Croydon. It also raised questions about the long term economic geography of the Greater London and the wider Southeast. I'm just going to give, provide a local authorities perspective on this issue from uh, London Borough of Croydon, including priorities for economic recovery and long term investment. So, um, you know, we are an outer London Borough and the pandemic has had a significant impact on the Croydon economy, especially for the evening and nighttime economy, retail and the leisure. However, there are positive signs already emerging in Croydon's recovery with businesses starting to innovate and change their business models and people starting to return to their business premises. 
However, we know that businesses are starting to look at the use of space differently. Our investment team have been significant um, rise in inquiries from inner city businesses looking to negotiate better deals in Croydon, where they have access to skills across South and great connections to, um, or into London down to Brighton with access to rail, M25 and an international airport um, at Gatwick. There is opportunity for South London, so that's what it shows. Croydon is still seeing growth with new buildings being completed. Construction is still strong in the area, although we cannot ignore the challenges that construction are facing with rising costs, recruitment and material shortages. The continued construction program offers opportunity and growth if we um, are clever. Um, as a local authority, our role is to create as many opportunities as possible through our levers. Often this can be through planning, licensing, economic development and inward investment. Good examples of this can be seen with us um, section 106, flexible planning and licensing support that enables businesses to use space and premises differently. The council has also supported businesses through the pandemic. As I mentioned, we have distributed over 93 million pound um, supporting over 15,000 businesses. Council have been an integral part of the emer emergency response from the government. This means we, we have never uh, known our business community better than we know them, them right now. And even um, some of those businesses, we didn't even have their contact details. Um, uh, so uh, pandemic has enabled us to make sure that we uh, collect the right contact details so that we can communicate with them uh, quite efficiently and effectively. And in our district centers, uh, we are seeing an increase in activities as uh, more people work from home. However, our town center is the focal point for much of our recovery work as we look to create a new vision for our town center following the lack of delivery for a new best field. So this again is an opportunity for creating a recovery that delivers new jobs and growth in growing sectors and high street use, for example, technology, universities, etc. So I just wanted to touch on skills um, here as well. So, so we have uh, we are very excited to bring London South Bank University to Croydon, especially in Central Croydon. So with that um, exciting new campus in the town centre and great further education and higher education opportunities for the residents. Um, you know, not only um, LSBU, we have the Spurgeon College um, in South Norwood, they are looking to expand. We have the University Centre of uh, Croydon College, or Hampton University, University of Sussex. To name a few, we are starting to see an opportunity for new innovation in the borough. However, it is important to create proper employment pathways that support our residents working with our schools, FE, HE, and the businesses to ensure that the right skills are available for business communities. And there is also some work to look at those people that have been made redundant to help them transfer skills. That's sometimes um, that we are noticing in the borough. So we are seeing a new um, businesses of starting up in our high streets, especially uh, you know, people who have lost their jobs, they decided to start up their own business with their passion. So we are seeing an increase of uh, new independent businesses in our high street, which is quite positive. So there is also an opportunity to create proper innovation with new knowledge transfer opportunities. Great example of this is the, the big project, the Business Innovation and Growth Project, a South London partnership project. Um, you know, it is delivering across the five boroughs that provide businesses with the university support. I touched on the business grant and um, we already provided um, you know, a number of business grant um, to our local businesses, but then we are continuing to uh, provide business grant support to our business community. And uh, we have uh, recently completed hardship grant, which is up to 2000 pounds for businesses who have been recently impacted by the Omicron variant. We have uh, started uh, delivering uh, the evening and nighttime economy grant up to £5,000 per business who have received the evening and nighttime economy grant previously. We have recently started the culture and the creative business grant. Um, again, um, the information is online for, um, in, in the council website. Uh, people can apply, the businesses can apply for their grant. And um, um, 
so a number of grants are available for the business community to apply for. And I just wanted to finish by talking about the mental health um, issues that we are seeing. Um, so with COVID, um, uh, you know, we are, what we are hearing is COVID, you know, mental health is going to be the ne next pandemic when we count, when come out of COVID, when we count, come out of the, the, the current pandemic we are under. And uh, some of the borrowers in South London, they have seen an 800% increase in the co calls from uh, people who have been going through mental health issues. And uh, that shows the severity of that issue. And that is something we really have to tackle when we come out of COVID and also when we are looking at the economic recovery. Um, so I'll, I'll stop here. I'm happy to take any questions um, along with other, other panelists. Thank you, Aisha. Uh, thank you ever so much, Councillor, for, for being here with us today. Uh, it was really um, impressive to kind of hear of the amount of grants that are out there for businesses. Um, and I'm sure if, if there are kind of businesses or all those involved or perhaps looking into starting their own businesses, that there is kind of a lot of opportunity that the lo local council is involved in and that, you know, they can uh, and, and perhaps should, you know, take the initiative and, and continue with those uh, ideals if they have them. Uh, you know, and I was really excited to hear about the fact that, you know, there are opportunities for those in, in arts and culture as well uh, on, on a local level. Uh, and I mean, Croydon's a very kind of busy and, and lively environment, but I'm excited that there is a campus also coming there, which will kind of hopefully suit uh, the Croydon environment as well. Um, and, and, you know, what I think kind of perhaps shook me a little, uh, but in a good way, and, and it's a good step forward that, you know, the local uh, council has had the opportunity to get to know local businesses better through the pandemic as well. Uh, like you mentioned, you know, with the contact details and, and hopefully that will be a two-way exchange and that, you know, the businesses will be uh, in, in contact with the, the council more uh, as well and hopefully benefit from, from all the opportunities that, that you've discussed. Uh, so thank you very much and, and hopefully I can feed some of the questions that we get in, uh, in, into the discussion at the end. Uh, now we're on to our final speaker, Solomon Smith, who is the co-founder and CEO of a very important uh, organisation, the Brixton Soup Kitchen. Uh, Solomon, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing about the work that you're involved with. Hello everyone, um, my name is Solomon Smith and I'm the founder of a homeless charity called um, Bricks and Soup Kitchen. So what we do at Bricks and Soup Kitchen, we provide hot meals and hot drinks, warm clothes, training, um, food packs, um, podcasting, garden workshops um, for homeless, um, less fortunate families and just kind of anyone that kind of just needs, does just needs extra help. You know, um, we we started 2013 just by giving hot tea, giving hot meals. And we just felt that, you know, even though, you know, there was quite a lot of adverts saying that, you know, they're here to help the homeless. We just didn't feel that it was coming into urban areas. And that was one of the main reasons why we started the charity. But we also made the charity an open door policy. So we made it where any and anyone could come. We don't discriminate on your race, religion, postcode, sexuality. We're totally blind to that. Our main thing that we see is that you're a human and that you need help. You know, and that is the, you know, that's what makes our, our charity so unique. So we get people coming from North, East, South, West. Um, we've had people coming from Hull, Birmingham, Manchester, who just needed a hot bill. You know, um, throughout COVID, um, unfortunately, we was a bit of the bad guys. Um, we couldn't stay in. We literally couldn't fathom just the government telling us we had to stay indoors when, in my mind, I'm thinking who's going to be out helping the homeless and helping the less fortunate families. So I decided to keep the service going um, by creating a... Um, the BSK COVID response team, where we made food packs. So we didn't have um, service users actually coming to the building. So we went to them. 
we literally had to keep our phones on because unfortunately, because everybody was staying home, a lot of homeless charities were were basically closed down throughout lockdown. So it literally made our numbers go up 300%, where we was literally, while the, while, while the streets of London were literally left derelict, we was the only ones driving around, dropping off food packs, dropping off hand sanitizers. Then we started working with elderly. So he's making sure that we was bringing them shopping, food. Um, we was getting a lot of support from hand sanitizer, new companies, um, companies making face masks. So we was literally delivering that all around the UK. We started to get a lot of um, families in Nottingham. So we was providing a lot of services, driving down from London to Nottingham during the, um, the lockdown. And for us at the soup kitchen, you know, we have a massive passion about helping people and, you know, realizing that, yes, we, even though we are in a country that is quite rich and wealthy, there's a lot of people on the sidelines that are struggling. And that's where, you know, the Bricks and Soup Kitchen comes in. Thank you so much. I mean, it was really impressive to hear that, you know, you didn't give up even though your workload increased by 300% and there were all the yeah. difficulties that, that there were of the pandemic and how kind of human centric your work is. You know, you didn't care what, you know, race, religion, sexuality or any kind of other that there is, you know, that you were there to help and, and support people uh, through the pandemic. And, you know, what I was kind of, and, and hopefully I can ask about this later on as we come on, you know, what, what these podcasts and, and how, you know, gardening and, and, and these other things that you do uh, play into the work as well. Um, thank you for, for everything that, you know, your organisation, your charity has been doing uh, through the pandemic because it's clear that, you know, it's, it's very kind of vital work for, for those on, on the ground who do need your help. Um, so thank you very much, everyone who's, who's kind of spoken so far. I'm just kind of going to look through the, the questions that we've got um, and, and hopefully uh, feed them into the discussion. And if anyone just wants to go ahead and, and answer uh, as, as I kind of read them, can feel free to, to jump at the question. Uh, so the first question we've got by uh, John, who's asking, how important is the kickstart scheme for young people? What do you think about it coming to an end? Uh, I don't know if any of your organisations were involved with, with the kickstart scheme at all, um, but, but it is coming to an end and, and it's kind of asking, well, how, how useful was it perhaps? And, and should it come to an end perhaps? If I'd, anyone wants to go ahead, yeah. I'd be happy to kind of start mm -hmm. the discussion on this. Um, so, well, at two, three degrees, um, we've kind of, we've had a two kind of two different ways of seeing it. We've kind of used the kickstart scheme to hire young people into our organization. But also we have kind of supported young people who have gone through the kickstart process, not directly, but indirectly working with them. Um, so for example, I would say the, the benefits of the kickstart scheme is that obviously it helps young people to get into employment, uh, which is really good because it can help them, you know, to um, get more experience, to do different roles and to figure out what they like in, in the working world. From a practical level, that can be positive. Um, I guess that I have um, some experience kind of from what I've heard from young people is that they don't always feel prepared for the interviews that they're doing on the kickstart scheme. So for example, um, I've had uh, young people come to me and um, who I mentor and support in South London and have said to me that they felt like they kind of got for this opportunity, but they didn't have the kind of support through kind of workshops or one-to-one -one, um, support a lot of the time because the job coaches at the DWP are so busy and have such a high load of kind of unemployment um, across the UK, not just kind of specifically in South London has been so high that they can't always provide that support that that young person needs on a one-to-one -one basis to them to the requirement that this young person is going to succeed in their interview so a lot of young people have come to me and said that they're really disappointed because they didn't do very well in their interview or they felt like they didn't kind of do as well as they wanted to and um, a lot of the time they say like 
that's because I didn't really have much experience of like kind of doing interviews or like what I didn't have the right the right clothes to wear I didn't know what to wear I really struggled with that um and again it's it's the kind of lack of uh, access and opportunities not only in terms of kind of clothing and young people not having the right attire to attend to interviews and the stigma that surrounds what you wear and things like that and how you present yourself um I think on the second side is it really highlights the importance of youth organizations such as two three degrees um and kind of others within our sector and that we we generally exist to help young people to get into employment but also to be the best versions of themselves so we don't want to set them up for failure effectively. Um, we will provide them with kind of employability support, how to do these interviews, like, you know, one-to-one -one support on what, what you should wear, what you shouldn't wear. We'll provide them kind of support in terms of if they need to get new items of clothing to wear to the interview, that's something that we can 100% support them with. Um, and yeah, I think the personal development employability skills aren't necessarily there at a standard that young, that, I would say all young people can flourish through the kickstart scheme. Um, but in a nutshell, I think the kickstart scheme, it's sad that it's coming to an end because I know a lot of young people have had employment through this scheme. Um, and we've got kind of a young two young people who work with us currently who are fantastic at two, three degrees. Um, and yeah, they came through the kickstart scheme. So personally, I'm a big fan. I do like it, but equally, I feel like obviously you need to be constructive in our feedback. And I feel like that would be the feedback I would provide on this kickstart scheme and how it could be um, improved for young people. Aisha, I'm happy to come in. Um, so obviously on the council's perspective, kickstart scheme has definitely benefited a number of young people in the borough. Um, Croydon, we have the highest number of young people in, in any London borough. We have 93,000 young people in, um, in Croydon. So you can imagine the need for a scheme like um, this benefiting our young people. And previously, um, in a pre-COVID, what we have done in Croydon is we have um, introduced an apprenticeship scheme called 100 Apprentices in 100 Days. And uh, so what we have done is we work very closely with the businesses, we very work very closely with the training providers and also uh, the people, mainly young people, and also we had over 50s who were really looking to change their career. So we were helping them to connect with the businesses and the training providers and that uh, to make a 100 apprentices in 100 days campaign very successful. That was a successful scheme. But then introduction of that kickstart scheme really helped those young people, especially um, the young people who be, um, you know, social isolating and self-isolating due to COVID and they didn't have any connection with, and they were away from their regular learning environment. So that scheme was really important for them to come out of that shell and make sure that they've been part of uh, that, you know, employment opportunity and working with a real business and get that, the, the, the real skills they need. And, uh, uh, you know, having the conversation with some of those young people and the training providers, it has definitely improved the confidence of our young people. And, um, and I do remember one, uh, one young person um, uh, who came out, you know, completed her studies um, at John Ruskin, wanted to, uh, wanted to become a hairdresser, but then obviously there were not much opportunities with COVID. And that was a difficult, um, uh, you know, decision for her to take in terms of which direction should she go to. And um, so for, for that sh short period, she then did, went into admin so that she can get some work experience and work with the business rather than going into hairdressing because obviously most of the hairdressers were closed and they were not business running at that time due to COVID and that, re that scheme really helped that individual. So, so, you know, in a nutshell, I just wanted to say that um, for some young people that made them think about whether that is the sector they want to go into, that have allowed them to think about a career change or sector change so that really helped them but it's a shame it's you know coming to an end and I, I really hope and as a council we do run a number of campaigns individually as well as working with the South London Partnership and the other five South London boroughs and also the London councils as well so we definitely look at you know running more campaigns to make sure that government will bring back either kickstart scheme or something similar so that we can support our young people continuously to improve their skills and also get them back into business rather than, um, you know, not being confident and not being 
um, you know, confident about going into uh, into an employer. Thank you very much for for the both of you there. Uh, Solomon, did you have anything to kind of add? Yeah, definitely. So for me, um, it was totally amazing. I didn't even know it was it was it was um, coming to an end, really. Mm -hmm. And that's quite that's quite upsetting because for us, you know, coming from you know a charity standpoint, you know, we we rely on donations. So for us to have, you know, I think we had two. We had two workers helping us with like our social media and marketing and things like that. And it was just so amazing that, you know, that they came, you know, that they was very good with the social media, et cetera. And just kind of just helping them with this, um, helping with their, with their, with their, um, with their core values on what they kind of wanted to do moving forward. So I think we definitely need to kind of figure out how we could kind of somehow see how we could, you know, maybe, kind of get it going or uh, if it's the government we might need to speak to uh just what because that was a very very good initiative yeah thank you very much for all three of you i mean you know solomon and hannah you both work with kickstart youth which is really important um and and you know thanks to to the individual who asked the question i mean there's like quite a lot of discussion and, and material that came out of that and how it everyone's for it continuing and, and perhaps there's some kind of uh, changes that they may need to be made to kind of empower you to, who are engaged in the program but genuinely that that it is a, a positive initiative that that we want to take forward um, another question and it's kind of a bit of a perhaps a difficult question uh, so if you want to answer with, with more than one thing it's okay um, what the question is what is the single most important thing communities can do to, to empower themselves so so how can we as as communities that local communities uh, empower ourselves and, and what do you think is the kind of most important factor or, or factors in that uh, I, I would say the, the 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 main thing communities and especially community groups need to do is to work together more the more the more you know every time that we've worked with different organizations and different charities it goes swimmingly it's literally a success however there there would be a lot of charities wanted to do the same thing a lot of companies wanted to do the same thing and they're literally just about number crunching and getting the most funding and that literally takes away the whole ethos of the word community you know so for us at the soup kitchen we're very hard on just you know you know thinking about the numbers and thinking about we're thinking about the work and what we can do to create change in our community. However, like I said before, I was just someone who just who just started in 2013, and I wouldn't be where I were where I am now if I didn't kind of link up with different like, um, homeless organisations and you know kind of learning from their um, ethics and ethoses and literally you know shadowing um, different community groups. You know that was my way of learning, and I just think the more we kind of do that more will be will be the best way of kind of connecting. Hi, Sha. I'm happy to come in. Um, I think to me, uh, what the community organizations can do is, um, you know, empowering our young people, um, you know, into education, into work or anything they want to do. You know, sometimes it, it's not education or, um, you know, work, they, um, you know, white collar job you talk about, you know, that the kind of job they want to go into. There are many young people in our community who want to go into different sectors. So empower them to make sure that we as a community or community can direct those young people to uh, achieve what they want to achieve in life. I mean, in Croydon, we have over 2000 community and voluntary sector organizations, um, you know, including the Lighthouse Society um, uh, that um, some of you, you know, you are part of. And when we look at the crime rate last year in 2021, we lost five young people to knife crime in the borough. And that's a big number. And, uh, you know, it's not just the 
victims. It's also the perpetrators who are who've been really affected as well. And um, so we are looking at supporting the two families. And um, so just you know, imagine the mental health of those the two families. Um, you know, losing someone from their family and also being impacted by um, in uh, the, the police and uh, all those interrogations. So. Um, one of the things that in, as a community, what we're planning to do is mentoring, introducing mentoring among our young people so that they can be get involved in more positive activities. And uh, we have a mentors from our communities coming forward. And some of them, they have had um, you know, difficult childhood and some, you know, they are happy to come forward and support our young people in that journey. So we really want some of those um, uh, community leaders or individuals to come forward and uh, become a mentor and support our young people to and, and make sure that they achieve what they want to achieve in their lives. If I could um, just jump in at the end here, um, Aisha. Um, yeah, I actually wanted to say that I totally agree. I was going to say I totally agree with what Solomon said in that we have like communities working together um, and, you know, kind of, I think what the pandemic highlighted um, for me personally, but also uh, just widely than that, is that um, it's okay to not be okay and the importance of mental health and working together to um, support one another and make sure that, you know, we're all kind of we're in this together effectively. Um, so I wanna say I really agree with Solomon, but um, I actually also really agree with Cancer, Cancer Manju about how kind of young people effectively are our future and um, statistics of knife crime and Croydon, again, um, and something that we need, shines a light on the kind of adverse effects of the like kind of youth not being and empowered to kind of, you know, do things that are positive in the community and things like that. So I'm really glad to hear that you're supporting both kind of sides um, of that perpetrators and victims. Um, so yeah, I think I actually just totally agree with both what Councillor Manju and what Solomon said. Um, yeah, I think that it's really important that we work together. And I think that kind of encompasses both aspects of what um, this has been said this evening. Thank you very much to all three of you. I mean, I've kind of I've made notes as you were speaking, but it's important to, I think, hear both the partnership uh, aspect, which, you know, also, you know, as, as our organisation, as a charity itself, uh, I think I've seen and, and, you know, my colleagues have seen it's, it's the best way because there are people throughout the country who are trying to do similar work or, or perhaps different work and, and you can complement each other with that. And, and also, I mean, we were involved in, in the Kickstart programme and have had two uh, young colleagues uh, employed through that as well. And, and you know, seeing uh, both kind of, uh, both of those streams uh, in, in our own organisation has been eye-opening for me. And, and hopefully it's something we can, you know, continue after, after we get through this pandemic as well. Um, just to wrap up, as, as we've got a few minutes left, I'll ask the final question that's come through. Uh, the question is some of the major businesses based in South London, such as PayPal, eBay, Haymarket, re businesses, uh, et cetera, but proportionately fewer large firms and over 93% of enterprises are micro firms. What can be done, or perhaps we can ask, you know, do we need to uh, attract more national or international big names to our boroughs? Um, is is that something that South London perhaps needs? And and if it is, you know, what can we do? What can we do uh, to to kind of introduce larger organisations to, to South London? Um, I would say the best ways to get the bigger corporates involved in in are even just coming to South London would be for them to truly support the community groups. So us at the soup kitchen, we've been quite lucky that we've worked with over 150 different corporates and, you know, they've literally been reaching out to us. So for us, you know, anytime that we might be doing a back to school drive or we might be doing a, um, a homeless Christmas drive, there's a lot of corporates we can reach out to. If it's Nando's, if it's Nickelodeon, if it's Nike, if it's Adidas. However, a lot of those corporates are far away. You know, so if we could kind of get them lucky, like, like what you've mentioned, if we can get them, you know, 
you know, in South London, we need to say to them, well, hey, if you're going to be in South London, you need to be supporting the community and literally supporting the community groups. Um, yeah, I, I think um, that is one of the things that as a council, I mean, I just came out of an, um, uh, an economic development uh, meeting looking at what the council should be doing in the next four years um, in terms of inward investment and also you know, attracting more larger businesses to the borough. So um, when, when we look at Croydon, for example, and, and as, as an economic uh, development lead. I also sit in the South London Partnership Board as well. So we hear about, um, you know, a number of businesses wanting to come to London, wanting to come to the South London. And uh, that's where the council work very closely with the, especially the Inward Investment Team, but very closely with those businesses who wants to come to the borough. Pre-COVID, we had a number of uh, international organizations. For example, I remember hosting um, you know, sessions for businesses who, who wants to come from China, India, Japan, and, um, um, and, and recently for even from Germany. So, you know, so we are getting a lot of interest from international organizations who want to have their base um, in South London and um, especially in Croydon, you know, I, I talked about the high rise building and the number of housing developments that's happening in central Croydon. At the same time, we wanted to attract more larger businesses to the borough as well. Currently, we have um, uh, 65 large businesses in Croydon and this, this is out of 15,000 businesses. So you can imagine the, the, the small proportion of the larger businesses. But then obviously, you know, um, uh, it is really important for us as a borough and also as this in, in South London to uh, make sure that not just, um, you know, larger businesses outside of London, but international businesses to have a base in our boroughs. And I think, you know, with COVID, there are definitely opportunities, especially with the digital connections that we are experiencing and look at us, you know, communicating through Zoom and other platforms. And uh, with those kind of opportunities, I'm sure, you know, there will be um, more businesses coming forward. And you must have recently, you know, heard about Google having their, you know, headquarters in, in central London and, uh, you know, their, their expansion, um, uh, you know, plans. And that is quite positive for, for London itself. And, um, you know, we would love to see uh, more of those businesses um, uh, showing an interest in our bara so that you know we can boost our economy and we we are already seeing you know london south bank university coming to the bara um you know the the, the lspu have received two million pound uh, worth of funding recently to attract more young people to uh, the Croydon campus, and that will definitely, you know, boost the economy. And um, it's not just bringing in the large businesses. There are other ways we can boost the economy, um, you know, through the, the opportunities we currently have and expanding that to other avenues. Um, I think I would like just just quickly just add um, a point onto this. I think it's a really interesting question, and I can definitely see the merit in bringing um, kind of larger corporates into um, the area. However, um, I guess um, I think as it was mentioned earlier, I think the pandemic has brought about a lot of entrepreneurialism, um, especially with the younger generation. And seeing this entrepreneurialism, like loads of small business coming up, um, and yeah, I'm I'm personally someone who loves to support local business, um, and especially young entrepreneurs. Um, so yeah, personally, I really like to see more kind of um, small businesses, entrepreneurial um, kind of in the an area. I think that's really great to see. And um, I think one thing where I've seen this through young people is um, there's a, a Brixton market um, of young people setting up stores um, and selling their goods, produce and stuff like that there and coming to me and saying like, oh, like I made X amount today. So many people like my products and stuff like that. Um, and buying kind of these homemade or like kind of ethically sourced or um, vibrant kind of um, produce from young people or from on, you know, like different entrepreneurs. Um, I think that's fantastic. So I can 100% see the merit in bringing large corporations um, into the fold. Um, but however, I would love to see more support for smaller businesses, entrepreneurs um, and the like. 
Yeah, thank you uh, to all three of you, uh, Solomon, Hannah, and, and Councillor Manji, for your contributions throughout uh, the panel discussion. I was, I had assumed it would be a bit of a grim discussion, uh, just because the topic of, of the economy is something that no one ever wants to talk about, but, but all three of you kind of brought uh, amazing things that you're doing in a local level, uh, uh, and you're both, you know, all three of you are kind of proactive, getting out there and, and trying to make a change in society um, in the different levels that, that you are. So thank you so much for, for the discussion. I honestly enjoyed it, and I wasn't expecting to enjoy it uh, as, as I came in. Um, and, and thank you so much for all the work you're doing. And I look forward to kind of seeing the work come to fruition and, and grow even more. So thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Aisha. Thanks for lighting us. Thank you.